Hi everyone. Um, so unfortunately I have to miss this class also and um, I'm going to record it so that you can follow along almost as if I was just giving a lecture uh, during the class and then we'll just shorten some of the class activities and um, you know today uh, focuses on step B and it's not due um, for I think almost two weeks not until the 15th about two weeks right April 15th so there's plenty of time to get the conversation started and then for us to meet and to ask questions and things like that so um, we'll, we'll do it like this and I'll share some of the activities and then um, I hope to be back with you guys um, on Monday and we'll move forward with some of the, the final chapters in the book but um, congratulations on getting to step A or, or for everybody being pretty, pretty close to finishing step A um, and so I'm going to talk today about moving on then to um, step B um, which is, I said before, it's almost sort of backwards, right, because step A is more about the, um, uh, the study method and the procedures, and step B really is about the introduction section. But let's talk a little bit about um, what step B is asking of you and, and why it's so important. Right? So if you go, maybe I'll, I'll, I'm just going to close out for a second, but if you go to the research handbook that you use to, to do the step A work, if you keep moving forward and you get to page 10, you'll see the step B um, requirements. And it's, ba it's basically an outline of the introduction section. And we think it's such an important step because the outline really helps you to organize your thinking um, before you actually focus on the writing process, which sometimes is, is for actually for most writers, and even, you know, even myself, the, the actual writing and the word selection and how you finesse it, all of that is actually pretty hard. And so this is that step where it really just helps you figure out what arguments you want to make, what you actually want to say before you um, spend all that time messing with the actual writing itself. And so um, if, you, if you had read through this part of the, the handbook, you'll see that it's a three to five page double spaced point based outline. And then we'll talk about what that basically means. Um, and it's asking you to add an additional source. So step uh, a was based on five empirical articles, and then step B, we're going to ask you to, to try to get one more um, to add to the mix, and then um, submit actual full PDFs of the articles, not just the abstracts, and then also do a, an APA style reference list at the end, which um, you'll just get some more practice doing that. But you know, if you if you read on a little bit further, you'll see right the description of basically that the outline is really uh, an internal writing tool that can help you organize your writing. And I highly recommend it if you don't do this um, already when you guys go to write papers. Um, it's such an important tool because um, sometimes you can figure out you know what how you want to change your argument or you know how you want to develop your argument before, like we said, you know before you spend the time actually. Um, writing, right? Spending the time agonizing about what words you're going to choose and how you're going to edit. Okay, so you can obviously keep reading a little bit more about this, but there's, um, if you scroll through, there's information about, right, sort of APA style um, tips at the Isle of Purdue, and then a sample. Um, and the idea is that really that anything that's in bold in here, we want you to keep exactly the way that it is. And, um, and that's really because it's just going to help to organize Right, you're, you're thinking, and for step A, you may have written um, sentences, but this for step B, we're going to um, uh, ask you guys to just focus on um, really sort of keeping things in an outline form because it, it is much easier to sort of figure out what, what points you guys are trying to make if you keep it in this form, right? So all everything that's bolded and underlined will stay as is, and then um, obviously you'll, you'll go in and add, uh, you know, information. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slides because a lot of what is in here, um, we flesh out and talk a little bit more about how to actually do this, right? So, um, so I, you know, oftentimes I like to think about, you know, um, when I really boil down what's going to go on my introduction section, the idea is really to sort of think about the elevator story. And that's like, imagine that you, you come to the social sciences building and, and you see Dean Wong maybe, and you guys are both waiting for the elevator. And then you hop in the elevator and she asks you what classes you're taking. You say, oh, I'm taking this research methods class, I, you know, 121. And she says, oh, I, you know, I, I've heard that you actually write a paper in that class, a, a research paper. 
and uh, you know, have you picked a topic and what's your paper about? So um, you can imagine maybe if you're just going from floors one to five, what your elevator story might be, like what you would actually share with Dean Wong. And if I were in class, I'd say, maybe just turn to your neighbor and maybe just talk about what that elevator story would be. And it, I, I would imagine that hopefully it's sort of the major points of your introduction section. Maybe like the, the first, like maybe the, the uh, four or five, maybe three or four uh, main points that you want to make. And so that's what we're going to focus on, you know, trying to, trying to get to it in step eight. And then, oh, you, the, you know, the elevator would bing. And she'd say, oh, well, thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you for sharing your, you know, the your uh, your uh, ideas for your paper and uh, I hope you have a good semester, right? Okay, so here's probably the most important thing uh, when we're writing the introduction section for the for the paper. And the, the first thing is really that we are really asking you to step out of the student role, right? So most of the time it's, it's right, you're sort of, uh, you're taking in information and trying to figure out what to do with it and um, oftentimes when we ask you to complete assignments, like professors ask you to complete assignments, the assignment comes in the form of, oh, okay, here's what I found for you, right? Sort of here's the, here's the assignment, here are the requirements, and here's what I found. And really for, for this, when you're writing an argument-based research paper, you really are stepping out of that role, and it's more of a, like an expert role um, with that orientation that's like, here's what you need to know. Right, so given what I know about this topic and me being an expert on this topic, um, here's the important pieces of information that you should know. And that's hard, right? Because you guys are, you guys are for, for the most part just learning about the topics. These are new topics for you guys. You just sort of pick them. Some of them don't even have a lot of research, right? And so we are asking you to do something that's um, somewhat awkward and strange. But that is really sort of how you should be thinking about this, right? Especially when you think about when you guys uh, finish these papers and go to present to us at the end of the semester, you're, you're going to be more expert than, than um, a lot of us, including myself, right, on your topic, because it might be a topic that I just, I know nothing really about, right? Anyway, so that's, that's the sort of framework. That's the lens that we're going to use when we think about writing these step Bs. Um, and if you read over the, the requirements for step B, You'll, you'll read all these all this stuff about themes, right? And basically a theme is a scientific point that you want to make and what you want to share with your readers. Um, that's it. That's basically it. So we keep saying, like, what's your theme? What's your theme? What themes? How many themes are you developing? It's really just the points that you want to make. Um, and the goal is really to develop themes to help the reader understand why your research question is important, why it's worth asking. Right, and um, what kind of research problem that your research topic or you know research question is actually addressing? And the research paper handbook, right? If you read the tips for step B, right, it'll talk a little bit more about sort of what these themes uh, might look like. And so this is an example, right? So an example of one theme or point could be shyness is related to the style of humor that a person uses. And then your job is to provide supporting evidence for the theme, right? And you just, the question that you're always basically asking yourself is, if I'm gonna write these points down, right, number one and two under this theme, um, how well do those points, or, or how well is that scientific evidence that I'm, right, sort of describing in one and two, how, how well does it actually support the theme? Um, and for this assignment, for step B, we're not asking you to write everything that you plan on writing in your introduction section, but just the main, Right, so themes and then how you're supporting it with evidence. So in this case, the theme of shyness is related to the style of humor that a person uses. And then one of the pieces of evidence is um, by this study that Martin and his colleagues conducted in 2003. And one of the main points in that study is that shy people are more likely to use affiliative humor. So that seems to, you know, just shy people are more likely to use affiliate humor. That seems to, to um, fit with the, right, support the, the theme. Shyness is related to the style of humor that a person uses. And then the second one um, by Martin and, and colleagues, I guess the same study. Affiliative, oh, I just noticed the typo. There should be an I after AFFI. Affiliative humor is an interpersonal form of humor that involves use of humor, telling jokes, saying funny things, or witty, ban or witty banter. So hopefully when you look at number two, you're thinking, oh, that actually sounds more like a theoretical definition than it does um, evidence to support the theme. 
right? So if you read it again and just, you know, sort of look it over, yes, one supports it, two, eh, it's probably something that's going to show up in your paper because we do want you to provide theoretical definitions for the constructs that you're using or presenting, but, right, not necessarily evidence for that particular theme, right? So you, I would not, you know, if this were your paper, I'd be sort of Xing through two and being like, ah, this sounds more like a theoretical definition. Don't put it here, right? All right, so for you guys, as you plan your projects now, um, hopefully you've already started this where you're reviewing articles and you're asking yourself questions like, how do the findings of, a, of the article that I found relate to my research question? Um, hopefully you're thinking, oh, do they support any kind of claims or points that I'm trying to make? Do they contradict points that I'm trying to make? Um, you know, when you have a, a when you have two two different articles, are they taking the, the claims or themes in different directions? Right, so this is all the, the, the stuff that's happening as you're writing, hopefully, your annotations and trying to understand, like, what kind of research question is important to develop. And you've already done a bunch of this because you have written up your step A. But I imagine as you continue to dig and write more annotations and think more critically about your topic, um, that you may actually shift the stuff that you wrote in step A. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, I've had students that actually just completely change their topic after submitting step A. And that's fine too, it just ends up being potentially more work, right? Because you won't necessarily get feedback on that, on a new topic, but you can always come and talk to, um, to Carly and me, of course. All right, so how do we do this, right? The first step, of course, is just to understand the article, right? So, you know, if you find an article and you decide that it's worth keeping, you do your speed reading, and you're like, ah, oh, this one's probably close to, you know, something I'd like to, to read more about. Um, and then just write, you hopefully create an annotated bibliography that includes citations and annotations for each of the articles that you're reading. And then you just want to make sure you understand the gist. Oh, um, we're going to come back to this actually at the end. So, hope, you know, let's, let's, let's wait for a second um, and, and move on. Um, so the main purpose of the outline is you're creating... Um, sort of, you know, the, the points for your introduction is basically just organized research literature um, and and the way you're thinking about your topic around themes, right, around points. So you're not just summarizing findings, right? It's not just basically a collection of study findings, but you're trying to, you know, make some sense of it and, and organize it into some uh, uh, three, four points um, that are important to, that you think the reader should know. And so uh, your your synthesis of the liter literature should be worth more than the sum of the parts, right? So it's not, hopefully it doesn't just read like a collection of abstract summaries, right? Your, your step B, but uh, it's going to be, you know, bits and pieces from different abstracts, right? That are going to be put in and organized in ways that they're going to be um, supporting different points that you're trying to make. And a uh, social psychologist uh, who wrote a really good article about uh, how you write a good research article, he wrote, uh, good writing is good teaching, right? So when you get to the point where you can actually explain to somebody uh, what it is that you want to say and you're trying to teach them about a topic, um, that usually translates into good writing. And if you're not sure yet what you're trying to say or what you're trying to teach somebody, then um, sometimes you can, you know, well, most of the time you can tell that from the writing, right? Because the writing isn't clear either. Okay, so we're, we're obviously striving for some some good writing and some good teaching. And uh, when you're all done, the nice thing is, is that step B turns into your, the introduction section for your paper. So obviously step B is more an outline form, but if you look at the, the components of it, like the general topic and the critical lit review and the rationale, those three sections, that is really basically how your, your introduction section is gonna go. There's gonna be sort of a general topic paragraph or two, there's gonna be a critical lit review, a couple paragraphs about that. And then, um, you know, a paragraph or two about the rationale for, for your study, right? So, I mean, we're trying to work in, obviously, assignments that are going to help you guys create your final paper. Okay, so uh, a little bit about intro sections. And so think about the ones that you guys have read and that you have liked. And hopefully, you know, you've read some where you think, oh, this was really good writing. This was very helpful. It was organized in ways that really helped me understand what, right, this topic's all about. And um, there's two main functions that these introduction sections serve, right? So one is if it's done well, it really does kind of awaken our interest, right? So um, hopefully we read it and we think, ah, oh, I'm, I'm really like to, to understand a little bit more about this. Most of the time this happens when we're direct in our writing, 
right? We're pretty clear and to the point, and we make it really readable, right? So we want to write in ways uh, where it's pretty plain language and uh, that it, it doesn't confuse the reader, right? Uh, the second uh, function that it serves is, is that it's informative, right? So it has to provide enough information to prepare whoever's reading it um, to understand the paper. And the goal is to do it at a level that the person reading it is not a specialist, right? The person is maybe sort of a psych 101 student or I've, I've said grandma plus, right? So somebody who's in, maybe in your family who knows just a little bit about research methods, but not a lot and maybe doesn't really know about your topic at all, right? So you want to make sure to prepare the reader with enough info that they say, all right, this, this is an important topic and I understand why now. Um, and the other, uh, one other way to do it is, is obviously to provide theoretical definitions, right? So that, that maybe happen when you were even just doing peer reviews of um, the step A's for your partners, or maybe a, the, the person introduced a variable or a construct, but then didn't provide a theoretical definition. And then hopefully, you're right, there, there, there's that feeling like, huh, like I wonder what that is, right? So when we provide those de definitions, it, it does help the, um, help the reader to understand and follow along also. And then um, the other part of the intro is that we really just want to be informative, right? And that usually starts or is grounded really in um, the, the storyline, right? Like what actually what you're trying to actually get across to your readers. And the storyline really depends on the type of paper. We are I'm, I'm, for this particular class, we're asking you to write the second one, this hypothesis testing kind of paper. Um, and the storyline really begins with the research question, but a lot of times there are papers that are just uh, descriptive papers that maybe uh, review a literature on a certain topic. Um, they might not do a, like an actual research study that the paper might not describe that, so it's non-empirical. And in those types of cases, the, the storyline really begins with the message, right? The sort of primary message that you're trying to get across to your reader. But in our case, it is really going to start with the research question. That starts our story. Um, and when you think about the themes that you're trying to develop in the paper, it usually ends up being about three or four that are these things, right? Unknowns, a known or unknowns, an unknown or unknowns, and a research question. So actually the themes, I should have said that differently. I think on the next slide, you'll see a better description of it. The themes really, I think, get, uh, get described in the knowns and the unknowns. The research question is the research question. <laughs> so hopefully this will become a little bit more clear um, when we talk about the, the examples too. Um, and you know, for your reader, you wanna make sure they understand um, like what you need to know about the topic or what, sorry, what is known about the topic, right? So what does previous literature say about whatever topic, research topic you're, you're pursuing? Um, what we don't know, right? So like uh, a, somehow a description of the unknown, like. Uh, the hole in the, the current uh, research literature, which sort of becomes almost like the research problem right, that you're trying to address. And then um, the specific research question for the study, right? And as we've described before, we want to make sure that you include just the, the, all the study variables so that that's clear to the reader. All right, so here's the, or, the organization. When you really think about it, the, this is how I mentioned that. So the themes, right, and this, this is sort of a, a funnel shape that we think about for the introduction. A funnel shape mainly because at the very top of the funnel, it's uh, there's the widest part of the funnel, and that's uh, because it's right sort of the broadest uh, information that you're sharing. And then as you move through the introduction section, which is sort of moving down the funnel from A, B, down to C, um, we want to get a little bit more specific, right, for the reader. So we start off with sort of like broad overviews of what maybe is known um, in the research literature, and then we narrow it down a little bit more. There might be another known, um, but then as we get even like, you know, further down the funnel, more specific, we highlight some of the unknowns. And then uh, as you get to the very bottom of the funnel, the C, that's the most specific part, and that's where we then right, share the, the, the research question for, for our paper. All right, so that's we're going to sort of uh, wrap our brains around that shape because that is the goal that your step B will also follow that shape too. When you're outlining, right, three or four themes, hopefully they will start uh, pretty broadly and then become a little bit more specific. Um, oh, and I think I just said that, right? So the themes uh, lay out scientific significance, research problem, and how 
uh, project advances scientific knowledge. The idea that sort of that happens across your knowns and unknowns, right? The combination of those. And uh, the research problem, right? Trying to actually develop one. Well, uh, let's talk about a few examples. And this is also in the research paper handbook. Um, it's either in step, the description of step A or right before it, um, where it talks about different ways that you might develop research problems. These are not the only ways, but these are the ones that come up uh, most frequently. Um, and uh, some examples are things like contradictions of findings, right? So if you have um, two studies that uh, support one set of findings and two other studies that support a different set of findings, um, then that sets up often a pretty good um, research problem where you have some no but then the unknown really is that you know there's some there's some conflicting information out there right so that your study is going to then try to to try to solve this right sort of this, this conflicting information um, there could be examples of things like contradictions of kinds like so maybe previous research all the way up until now um, has uh, believed that right sort of affiliative humor is like is like one subset of a certain type of certain type of um, interpersonal humor that people use. But um, more recently, we're finding that maybe um, affiliative humor is not right in a, this type of interpersonal humor, but is actually a totally different type of humor that um, more people have been researching recently, but we don't really know much about yet, right? So there's this problem that what we thought used to be one thing is actually not, right? And then we're gonna try to solve that maybe in a, in a research study. Um, external cause effect contradictions right so maybe once upon a time we thought that you know um, you know parenting uh, uh, the way parent uh, the way that adults parent their kids um, had causal links with uh, antisocial behavior but we're actually finding that that's that's not necessarily the case and that there's right, sort of other factors that are more important to consider um, that's the kind of right sort of contradiction that might be important to, to solve in future research and then the last one that um, I think we're seeing more and more of is that maybe there's this uh, uh, an issue that's really important to our society, and uh, there's there's limited research on the topic so far, but it's important to consider it maybe because of some um, some changes that we're seeing in sort of how how we live, right? So I'm, I'm imagining something like social media, right? So this like explosion of social media that's happened in your generation, it really has. Right, sort of change the way that we interact with each other, and, um, and it's not going anywhere, right? But um, if you can show that there's not a lot of research on the topic, but it's important because, right? I mean, we have millions, billions, right, of people sort of using these uh, this technology. That that might be right a way to, to create um, importance, right, of a scientific importance for a question. And that last one is actually one I'm going to show you an example of um, in a little, a little bit later. Okay, so outlining the introduction, and I apologize if I'm sounding um, sort of uh, not so enthusiastic. I actually really love this, <laughs> love this topic very much. All the step B work and everything that goes into it. I've just I've had a, a long couple of days, so my, my body is starting to feel, <laughs> my body, my brain, I think is starting to feel it. Um, all right, so this is described. Oh, is it described in step B in the handbook? I think it, this the, the what I'm going to talk about is not specifically described. But what is described is the importance of um, using a point-based outline for this assignment and not a topic-based outline, right? So um, on the left is what we consider these topic-based outlines, examples, and then on the right is what we'd consider these point-based outlines, or in other words, like theme-based outlines, right? Scientific themes. And so, you know, an example of a topic for an outline would be like neighborhood violence, right? You might put like Roman numeral one, neighborhood violence, right? And then you might put something in your outline about it. What we are uh, encouraging you to do or requiring you to do for this assignment is to not write the topic, but write the actual point that you want to make about that topic. And that's because the point is much more specific and the point to, do, to write it um, requires you to do some digging, right? Some research digging and really understand kind of what's out there and what you want to say about it. Because it's pretty easy, like imagine like, right, I mean, if you really had to, you could pull together a, a, an outline, a topic-based outline pretty quickly if you didn't have to write the points associated with it. Um, but then, you know, when you go to actually think about like writing your introduction section, it's kind of like, well, I'm not sure what I want to say about this topic, right? 
So obviously we're pushing you to do the point-based one first. So instead of just neighborhood violence, right, your outline might say, uh, theme one, exposure to neighborhood violence is linked to anxiety, right? And uh, a topic might be gender differences, right? But well, the question is, what point do you want to make about gender differences, right? Um, and it may be that women are more affected than men by the negative effects, right, of neighborhood violence, something like that. Um, and then, you know, if, instead of saying just study A, right, for a topic-based outline, right, if you were actually going to write a point about it, you would obviously write the sort of the, the, the main takeaway message or the main takeaway finding from study A. So something like that. Okay, so then you're going to use a point-based outline basically to create the introduction themes. And so if you look at the sample, you'll see, right, theme ones, theme two, and then, um, Right, what the theme is, and then evidence under it, and that's sort of the the the, uh, the format that we're asking you to use. So, right, the first theme um, is going to articulate some type of known, and so one example is something like um, teenagers who have deviant friends are more likely to get involved with antisocial behaviors. So we do know this, and then you put include some in-text citations to support that, um, and then theme two, uh, you hopefully are going to articulate something else, <laughs> more specific. Right, so now we're moving down the funnel. And um, it might be another known that you have, right, based on the research literature. So another known could be the link is particularly strong for youth living in low-income neighborhoods, right? And you have some, some sites for that. And then the final theme, if this is their, if you have three themes, hopefully the, you, we want the third theme to be some type of unknown, right? So known, known, unknown. Um, and articulate what is unknown, in other words, sort of the research problem that you're trying to develop. And then uh, in this case, it could be something like, it's unclear if the link between peer deviance and delinquency is the same for males and females. And then you could include some sites that right, sort of help to articulate that theme. Um, for the assignment, we're saying that you have to have a minimum of two themes. So that would be a, a known and an unknown. Um, and then you, you could have more. Most people, I think, tend to have three. Um, four is okay too after that. I mean, even four sometimes gets a little bit sort of tough to manage. So I, I would highly recommend three. I feel like that's a, that's a good number. That's what I used in this example. Um, so the, the handbook has some extra tips on how to write the themes. Um, it also gives some examples of scientific evidence. You'll see some stuff flushed out a little bit more than um, what I put on the slide. And remember, you're always asking yourself as you write up, you draft out these outlines, does this example of scientific evidence support my theme, right? That's always the question each time you write it, right? And that's how you're going to be evaluated too. So when I review the stuff in step B, right, each one I'm going to look at, each bullet um, or each piece of evidence and ask that same question too. So um, let's look at a, a quick example. And then um, I included also an actual sample. So I think it's this one. And so the, the example I'm going to start with is, um, this was actually a question that came up in a previous class. And I just, I thought it was just a really uh, uh, helpful way to think about sort of how to, how to move forward with the work. And so the scenario is that, um, and I'll just do that so I, right? The scenario is that um, a student came and said she wasn't sure what direction to take her themes. Um, and when I asked what she had so far, she said that um, she knows that she wants to tell the reader something about how it's important to study the effects of marijuana on driving because research shows that marijuana can have negative impacts on cognitive and physical functioning. Right, so it was um, just, yes, tr trying to figure out like what kind of theme she would develop, how she would organize those, but she knew that was something about marijuana effects, driving, right? Um, and maybe something about uh, some, like, you know, how you function. And so then I I asked her the big so what question, right? This sort of often like, just anytime you have your question, you know, sort of it's the, like, why would we care, right? Like, why should we care about this topic? Um, and why should someone take precious time out of what's probably, like they're a very sleep deprived day, right? To read and understand research about this topic, right? So it's always that, like, you think if you had a pot of money, would I spend it on this? Why should I really care about this? And our response was because marijuana might be legalized soon, and so this drug might be used more frequently in society, which is a great response. And then I responded, of course, that's great, because those are your themes, right? Yes, you have your themes. 
Um, and then you just want to make sure that you can actually back them up with evidence, right? So if that's your gut, and I think she started that way because that was sort of where her gut was and that she had heard some of this information, but um, she wasn't sort of sure what the evidence was, right? So then you got to go back to the literature and sort of dig a little bit and see if you can actually back that up. And so um, hopefully your wheels are spinning already and the research problem in this kind of example, um, I think the best fit, at least the way that she has described it here, is it's the one that's about significance to society and there's limited research on the topic, right? And so for me, if I were going to try to develop this research problem, um, I would think it's important to convince the reader that this whatever phenomenon that you're studying, in this case, right, sort of marijuana use, that this phenomenon is on the rise in society, right? So it's basically trying to convince the reader that um, marijuana use is going to go up because, uh, because of its legalization. And there's definitely, there's already some evidence to suggest that, right? So you just define that evidence. And that we need to better understand the effects because there's evidence that marijuana use might have negative effects on some behavior, right? So um, she already knew, yes, there's some inkling, right? Some of this stuff is true. So now let's go, let's go digging and get this stuff and put it into our, put it into our outline. Um, before we close this example, I just I want, to, want you to consider sort of two, two claims, right? Two ways of sort of thinking about this, because um, this has come up in, in other people's uh, step Bs in the past. And so imagine this, this first claim that says, we need to understand the effects of marijuana use on X, in this case, maybe like cognitive or you know, f physical functioning, because it's on the rise in society and limited research has examined the effects of the drug on X, whatever your behavior is, right? So think about that for a second. And now contrast that to this, writing it this way. We need to understand the effects of marijuana use on X because there's limited previous research and we should want to understand it better. Right. Or even just saying, and it's important to understand it better. I mean, that's another random. So let's say we should want to, or it's important to understand it better. Um, and when you think about, when you read those two claims, I hope that right, your mind is saying there's a more compelling reason in the first claim for scientists to pursue the research question. Um, and the second one, at least the way that it's written here, the way that the student wrote it, it sounds more like you want to pursue it because of personal interests, right? So even though there might not be previous research about the research question, it still sounds like a more like a personal interest, right? Because it's important to, or we should want to understand it better. Um, but there's not a lot of like, right, sort of scientific motivation to, to pursue that one. Um, but even just adding that piece that li like limited research has examined the effects of the drug on X and we know what's on the rise, right? That, that little tweak um, sort of pushes it into a, right, sort of a, um, um, a category where it's just, yeah, there's more scientific, uh, uh, scientific reason, right, to pursue that one. Oh, and then to follow the recommended funnel shape of the introduction section, I recommend that the students start with the broadest claim, right? So you always think starting at the top of the funnel, what what's an important known that you want to make clear? Um, so it could be something like um, uh, how uh, marijuana legalization is likely to increase marijuana use, right? So that could be the theme, and then you'd provide some evidence, right, to back that up. Um, you could do that as one theme. You could break it into two themes. Um, if it's broken into two themes, you just want to make sure that, right, you just sort of start with the broader one first. And then, you know, the second or third, or however you did it, you know, theme um, would be a little bit more specific, right, because you're moving further, you're moving down the funnel. And then I would make that one about maybe how marijuana use negatively impacts um, behavior, whatever the behavior of interest is, driving or cognitive functioning, right, so you can have some evidence to support that. And then the final theme would be an unknown, right? Um, you know, basically convincing the reader that there's limited research that has uh, looked at the effects of, or examined the effects of marijuana on behavior, right? All right, and there, there could be your three, th uh, your three themes. And then it's, of course, it's important to just, for each of the themes to make points or claims and, and not just represent topics, right? So this is just one illustration of, right, how you might think through how to develop the themes for your own project. And then the final thing I think that's uh, worth doing is um, this in-class exercise. So I'm not going to ask you to, to actually do the exercise, um, but I will maybe review uh, one, um, you know, sort of one activity within it, and then um, ask you guys to um, look at the rest of the activity. And then when we come back to class, 
on Monday, we'll, uh, we, we can review what you guys came up with, right? So basically it's, I have a, I, I wrote out a couple of annotations for a couple of articles, assuming that maybe these were the topics that I was, you know, trying to develop. And then um, I wrote them out in ways where there's pairs of annotations, right? So it's like, imagine you have two articles that you have created annotations for, and then your job is to try to think through what kind of research problem um, you could develop, you know, based on the annotations. Um, and so it'd be important to think through things like what the scientific known is, what, uh, you know, maybe if you wanted to do two of them, you could do two, a second scientific known, and then what a scientific unknown is, right? So that collection right here of these three, right, sort of knowns and unknowns would be was sort of where you develop the, you know, the, the research problem that you're, for your particular study. So let me, let me show you what I mean. Um, step reviewing annotations, right? So these are all in the Canvas module. So the slides are there, uh, the module for today's class, and then these handouts that I've been um, toggling back and forth with. And the research handbook itself is actually right in the, in the handouts too from earlier in the semester. Okay, so here, right, the instructions. There are two sets of annotations below. Imagine that these are annotations you have written to develop your own research paper or study. Hopefully you have at least four already written, right, because given that step A was supposed to be based on at least four empirical studies, so hopefully you have, you've done those in the background to sort of help develop your projects. Um, your job is to review the pair of annotations and do the following for each pair, right? So identify scientific themes or points you want to make, and otherwise the points you would develop in the paper's introduction section to help convince the reader that your study addresses a scientifically interesting research question worth asking. That is one that actually tries to solve a research problem. Um, hint, below are the steps that should convey the research problem to the reader, right? The known, kn knowns and unknowns, right? Um, identify a research problem to solve given what you learn from both annotations. And then identify a research question. Right? Remember that you should be able to identify all study variables in your research question. Um, and then after you go through these steps for the examples below, it's recommended that you do this for your own project, right? Because that's basically how you're going to develop your outline for step B. Um, and so you don't have to go through all of these steps, but this would be, it, it, it is a helpful exercise, right? To sort of um, think through this, write the stuff down, and it does really help you to prepare for sort of how you would do it for your own paper, right? But I'm not going to require it. You don't have to hand anything in, but we will talk about them um, our next class. So I'm just going to read you, I'm going to read it out loud and then um, just share with you how I might go about right, developing a research problem for these. So the first study, here's the annotation for it. Researchers from the University of Pittsburgh used survey data from 732 college students right, to examine the effects of Facebook use on mental health, specifically depression. The study uses the framework of social rank theory of depression and conceptualizes Facebook envy as a possible explanation for the link between Facebook use and depression among college students. Facebook envy is defined as the feeling you get when you come across an old friend on Facebook and realize that his or her life turned out way better and is more interesting than yours. Study results suggest that Facebook use in and of itself does not predict depression. Instead, the experience of Facebook envy is what predicts depression among college students. These results are similar to findings reported in previous studies, blah, 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 blah. strengths of the study, right? Use of a large ethnically diverse sample, use of valid measure of depression, limitations of the study, research did not examine if findings were the same for students from different ethnic groups, and then a next step, and then I, I put the, the the reminder here that this is supposed to be developed. This is that uh, that you develop this based on your own thinking, right? So the next steps is the place where I just like to include notes for myself in my own annotated bibliography about like now that I've read this um, and given what else is in my annotated bibliography, what else would I want to do? Like what other study do I want to find? What direction do I want to go? And in this case, I wrote see if there's reason to think that study findings will be different for students from different ethnic backgrounds. Um, look for studies that suggest that people from different ethnic backgrounds might react to social comparison with peers differently, right? Because that seemed like, based on this study, that was like, oh, that seems like an interesting direction to go. I don't know if there's anything out there, but, right. So then I went out and searched, and I found this article. Uh, researchers from Colgate University used survey data from 1,245 college students to investigate the effects of social comparison with peers on academic and mental health outcomes among Asian American and Caucasian students. 
Study results suggest that effects of social comparison on mental health are stronger for ca Caucasian students, such that Caucasian students were more depressed if they thought that their friends were adjusting to college life better than they were. Social comparison had similar effects on academic outcomes for both groups of students. Um, specifically, negative social comparison um, were linked to lower GPAs for both groups of students. Study strengths use of valid measures of depression and academic functioning. Sample includes students from all levels. Um, study limitations, small number of Asian American students makes us question the validity of study results for this group. A next step could be um, find other studies of the effects of social comparison that includes a larger sample of Asian students um, as well as other ethnic groups. Right, so, you know, based on these, this pair of annotations, the question is, you know, um, what could be an interesting research study develop, right? And what kind of problem, research problem could we try to solve? And so my head, and part of this is, you know, I, this is how, why I wrote the, the next steps the way that it, I did, is that, um, you know, I would think that one important known is that there's research, right, to indicate that um, social comparison has effects, social comparison on social media, right, um, has the potential to impact mental health and academic outcomes, or you could just pick one if you think you're more interested in one, right, sort of mental health outcomes. Um, what else? Another known is, you know, I'm looking at uh, across just these two studies that, um, let's see. Oh, I mean, well, the first one could be about mental health outcomes. The second one could be that there's evidence that um, social comparison on social media has can impact academic outcomes, right? And then an unknown would be, especially because it looks like a study limitation here in the second one is that there were small numbers of Asian students, right? Makes the question the validity of the study results for this group is that it seems just based on these two studies that it's still unclear whether uh, these study findings are the same for people of different ethnic groups, right? And so I, I think that's, right, you could develop that as an unknown and to provide evidence of that unknown, right, you would um, include one study, right, where the findings maybe did show that social comparison um, affects uh, people of different, of one ethnic group differently than the other. It could be another study um, that shows that there were no different differences by ethnic group. Um, but basically, right, if you have a collection, if you have a few different studies where the evidence is conflicting, right, that, that conflicting evidence, that collection of conflicting evidence does support the theme or point that it's still unclear, right, whether the effects of social comparison is different for, uh, the effects are different for different ethnic groups, right, make sense? Yeah, so that's probably how I would handle the first, this first set, and then you guys, um, I would encourage you to, to read the second two, because it's a different way of thinking about a research problem, um, and then there's one other, although I didn't write them out, but there's a, a, just a little scenario for a third set, and then, um, uh, when we could get back together on Monday, we'll maybe just talk with each other and then see what direction you guys went. Uh, and so the rest of the class is really just devoted to um, you being able to, to work on the step Bs while um, Carly's there with you. Um, I won't be available by phone during this time, at least not this time. Um, and so, like I said, there's, there's uh, almost two weeks, right, to, to work on step Bs. And I'll, I'll make sure to leave some time during our next class for you guys to ask questions. And we can do a couple more of these kinds of activities if it helps. Um, and so I, I wish you some good searching and some good drafting. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next week to, to connect in person. And I hope you have a good weekend. And uh, I, I thank you for all of the, you know, all of your efforts and all of the really cool ideas. So I haven't read them all, but just in talking with a, a small group of you, I'm really excited about the, about the directions uh, that your projects are going. So, and I'm excited when we get to the point where you guys get to share them with each other so that you guys get to, to, um, to hear about all the, the cool research um, ideas that your colleagues have. Okay, take care, everybody.